Hello, my name is Ramon Valdez, and a lot of the DMs and questions that I get are about the belt sander. This is an incredible machine and probably one of my favorite tools in the workshop. I'm going to show you a few tips and some pointers to help you get the most out of this beautiful little beast. So this is the Makita 9401. This is the original one that I got. This is old, probably in the 80s, right? Late 80s. And just a beast of a machine. I haven't hardly done anything to it. Occasionally, a trigger, a switch will go bad. Um, maybe a belt. I think that's all I've ever replaced on, on these machines. And this is the only one I bought, purchased new. And the rest of these I got off of eBay. And you can find pretty decent machines. This one was probably used once or twice. Just in fantastic shape. This is the one that I use the most, but they're all the same. This is one of my recent finds off of eBay. And this one actually came with a, about a foot long cord. First thing I do is take that off, put a long cord, right? And this is what I wanted to show you. So this particular model, and a lot of belt sanders that I see will come with a plate and a piece of cork. And this works okay, but here's what happens. The problem with this metal plate is that it gets dented. You know, if you're using this belt sander and you set it down and it set it down on a little chunk of wood or whatever, this thin metal is going to dent. Once it makes a dent, it's going to make a divot and it's just not going to be flat, right? And then when you start sanding something, that little dent is going to telegraph right into your work. So as you're sanding, it's tracing all these little dents right into your work. So not a very good design. You can see that this is held on with a metal bar and four screws. A lot of belt sanders are going to have a similar means of attachment. And first thing I do is just take this off. Take this off, take the cork off, throw it away. Sometimes I'll save that bar. This one has the metal bar. You can see I have the metal bar there, but I don't use it. But you never know, just in case. Save that little mar bar and uh, of course, save the screws. But toss this and then find some of this graphite material. These guys used to make an excellent product, Platte River. They're no longer making this, but there are other companies that are starting to make this uh, graphite, and I'll leave the links in the, to that in the description. But this is basically a PSA, pressure sensitive adhesive. So you peel this backer off and just adhere it right to this part of the belt sander. See there now i've mentioned that this is the 9401 and the 9403 or the 9404 i don't remember which but it has this kind of a waffle cross grid pattern it's still aluminum but you can still put this graphite on there and it's still going to sand extremely flat and these will last quite a while i mean these uh five pieces that i have here will last me years but they will start to wear you'll start to get uh, areas here that will get thinner you know as that belt is going across that even though it's the back of the belt there's no abrasive it still has some friction it's greatly reduced because it's graphite but it will start to wear on the corners or if you get a piece of debris between the belt and the platen it can cause a little wear pattern and then those wear patterns again will telegraph when you're sanding your work so you got to keep them clean and check them periodically. I check it every time I change the belt for whatever reason. If I'm changing to a different grit, I just take a quick glance at this and make sure it's still in good shape. When you go to adhere this, make sure that you clean this really well. I like to use denatured alcohol. You could use acetone or something similar. Just make sure that's really clean. Let it dry, flash off, and then adhere this. I'll even bend this front part down slightly just so it'll conform to that little bit of a curve it'll look something like that 
see how it's bent over that edge. And these come with a bag. I think most belt sanders are going to come with some sort of dust catchment, but these are, they're okay. And I just keep this because if I'm out in the field, maybe I will need that. For the most part, I just hook these up to a shop vac. Automatic, when you pull the trigger, of course, that's kind of the standard these days, right? Oh, and incidentally, another problem with the original factory metal plate is that it will get hot with friction and cause it to warp. Once it warps, it causes all kinds of problems. Get rid of it. There's a fantastic company on the, which you can find on the internet called E-Replacement Parts. And I downloaded this schematic of this particular belt sander, the 9401, and then any of the parts that, uh, that I'm looking for. I have this nice exploded view. And really the only thing that I've noticed that has ever gone wrong with these switch. So I just have a spare one of those. And I have a couple of spare belts, even though in decades I've only replaced one, but uh, just good to have. All right, let's take a look at a couple of things. These rollers need to be clean, right? And these don't have uh, really an area to, to, you can use a light grease. Occasionally I'll take this apart, there's a little snap ring on this side, and I know all belt sanders are gonna be built a little bit different, but these have basically bushings, and I just keep a light grease in those. Periodically, I'll check that. The bearings on these can go bad. I've only replaced, uh, I think, I don't know if I've ever replaced one on these sanders. I have it at the old shop I worked at, but they last a long time. This drive pulley uh, needs to be clean, can't have any grooves or anything or else it will just not work correctly right all right let me put a belt on here incidentally this retractor needs to be working smoothly i wouldn't add a bunch of oil to that but there are a couple of areas that you could put a small drop of light machine oil just to keep that working smoothly and you'll notice if it's not working properly it just won't um, retract like that. Let's add this belt on here. Of course you want your belt centered within the wheels and this is just a tracking knob, right? I'm gonna go ahead and run this and let's see what happens. There would be times at my old work when I'd be out in the shop and I'd be walking by one of the guys running a belt sander I'd, and I could hear that the belt sander was bogged down slightly because the belt had been tracked to this side and it will start digging in here and you can hear that difference. So that's one thing to watch. Of course you can see it here, but you can also hear it. So that's one reason I don't listen to music in the shop. I'm listening to my tools. They'll be talking to you. Yeah, check this out. You can literally hear this sander bog down. Yeah, in my shop, no music, no podcast. I listen to my tools. Hand tools, power tools, they all have a voice. Incidentally, a lot of belt manufacturers are going to put a, a, an arrow on here. A directional arrow. These are by Maverick Abrasives. There's not a, an arrow on here because you don't need one. Okay, so this seam is going this direction, right? From my perspective, it's going from the top left to the bottom right. But if I flip this belt around, guess what? It's still going that same direction. So if you see a belt with an arrow on it, whether it's for a belt sander or an edge sander, if it's this type of a seam, it doesn't matter which direction you put that. And you're gonna notice that you're gonna get a little bit more life out of your belts if you rotate them. So that's something to keep in mind. A lot of times the belt manufacturers will create this material and they'll be using it for different applications and that's why it'll have uh, direction because of how they're going to 
make their seams. But with these particular belts, for my belt sanders, that seam does not matter, and it, the belt does not matter which way it goes. All right, let's sand the board. So a lot of videos that I've seen, the guy doing the video will always say to start the belt sander, get it running, and then bring it down to your work. I could not disagree more. I believe the sander should be laying flat. You're gonna have a good hold on the sander so it doesn't get away from you, and then simply pull the trigger. And in some situations, it probably wouldn't matter if you did it that way, but if you're sanding something that really counts, running the sander to start and then bringing it down to the work, chances are you're going to bring the sander down slightly crooked and hit one corner or another and make a small gouge and it happens that fast. So if the sander's down to the work, you have both hands on the sander, you're balanced and you just pull the trigger and start moving the sander. That's really important is to keep that sander moving. Now, of course, moving it forwards and back isn't gonna make any difference in, in how fast it sands, but the key is to not let the belt track in one place, which would cause a groove. So really, what you're doing is moving it sideways, and a lot of times, I'll move like in circles or figure eight patterns, just something random, just to keep that belt sander moving. So just like that, smooth, controlled. This will seem awkward at first, stay with it. And one thing that really makes a big difference is try to focus the pressure on the middle of that four inch by six inch platen. Something that's really important is to start with a fine grit, finer than you think you'll need. And you might be surprised, it might be doing the job. If it's not, you can always go rougher. But if you start too rough, you could mess up the entire piece or just get a bad taste for sanders and never use them again. This particular board actually has a seam running all the way down it. I needed a, a longer or a, a wider piece. And so it's not quite flush, but it's really close. So one thing you can do to keep track of where you're at with your belt sander is to add some pencil mark, right? You've seen this before. So there's a, a joint right across here and so if I put pencil mark in that area, I should be able to see that. Is that showing up on camera? Yeah. Okay, here you can see one board is longer than the other, so that's where the seam would be. And all this pencil line, with the exception of a little bit right there, is all gone. So you know that this area here is slightly low, right? So I would just keep on going until all the pencil line is removed. Just like that, it didn't take long, all that pencil line is gone. And if I was to use a sander like this, it would, it would work. This has a hard pad, but the problem with these is that they sand, they will slightly round the edges of your work. Just because it's hook and loop, it's not, a hard pad. I mean, the pad is hard, but still the method of attachment leaves a little bit of slack and that little bit of slack or give will create slightly radius or rounded edges, corners, I should say. For many tasks, it probably won't work, but if you're doing face frames or if it's a, a piece that counts, look at that under magnification or put a straight edge across it. You will see slight gaps at the corners. A belt sander is going to sand dead flat if it's tuned properly. Then another trick that I like doing, you've seen this before I'm sure, is a low angle or a low raking light. I'm shining that across. If there's any discrepancy, you will see it. And there's a little bit of a dent right there. I don't know if you can see that. So that would have to come out. And this will really accentuate even sander scratches. I can see a little bit of a belt sander scratch. Maybe there was a little bit of dirt or something because that's probably not from the 180 grit. But I would sand this entire thing with 180 and then I could hit it with either a smoother grit or something like this since I'm not 
trying to remove a bunch of material, I'm not going to round those corners, especially if I'm aware of that and I don't hang out here or out here too long. Makes sense, yeah? Now this board I have here is just an example to show you, but this edge is very square. And let's just pretend that I wanted to move, remove these saw marks. Yeah, you could use a hand plane, a lot of ways to get rid of that. So let's use a belt sander. This is about 15 sixteenths of an inch thick or wide. This dude wants to balance on there, right? Because of that nice flat platen. And so we're just gonna let it do that. We can goose the throttle to stay in control. So yeah, I know goosing the throttle is related to gasoline engines back in the day, but it's very applicable here because it allows you to stay in control. Sanders with variable speed are awesome. I wish the Makita 9401 had it. Beautiful and dead on square. Yep, square and smooth. <laughs> Now, I have another video on this process, but I just want to show this to you again real quick in case you've missed it. We're going to remove that belt. We're going to add a curved platen. You can see these are just shop made. This one is a 30 inch radius, just a chunk of Baltic birch, a couple of straps to hold this in place. We're going to remove two of these screws. We can add this guy. And I like using a, a drill with a clutch when I'm adding these or if I'm changing a plate on a router, for instance. That way I don't know that I'm not going to strip the head of the screw. Right, same size belt, factory length. Squeeze this on here. Ready? Okay. Goes on. Still has plenty of slack, right? So this is a 30 inch radius. You can get down to about, probably about a 16 inch radius with this particular sander and this particular length of belt. So a 16 inch radius is smaller, which means more of a hump, which means it sticks out more this direction. And I could probably get re remove some of this to uh, make it work to an even smaller radius, but that's about the smallest radius that I've needed. It was a 16 inch radius, right? And then you can go up to whatever size you want. Here's one that's 114 inches. Sometimes I'll add some of that graphite material to them. These are all custom size different radiuses, and they will accomplish the same thing. Wow. All right, so check this out. <laughs> this crest rail or chair back, this is actually made of plywood, bent in a form, and then, you know, glue to create this curve. And then I added some end grain, solid wood Wenge end grain on the ends. Put a strip here, put one at the top, and covered this with veneer. And this has been sanded quite a few times. It's probably getting pretty thin. I made this for Furniture and Cabinet Making Magazine years ago as an article, uh, just to show this process. But uh, we're gonna sand this again, just to show you how awesome the belt sander is. I think I'll add some little wedges in here. Hold on. This could literally be anything just to keep that a little more stable. Raise that dude a little. Somewhere in there. That should work. 
And of course, you could add some pencil mark just to keep track of your progress. Once I add a curved platen, I like to run this to make sure that the belt's tracking correctly. You can see a little bit of pencil line there, but for the most part, all the pencil lines are gone. And that is beautiful and smooth. And awesome, right? Yeah, man, gotta love it. All right, so check it out. So all this hand-cut marquetry was made flush with a belt sander on these crest trails or chair backs. How fantastic is that? All right, remove that dude, put the screws back. How about an outside curve? Well, of course it would just be just as easy. Of course you need to watch this wheel in the front and in the back, right? But it's gonna work the same way. For something like this, I would take this and on um, one of the ends of my bench, I would probably clamp it here, let this overhang so the bench isn't interfering, and then I can bring the belt sander over the edge, flip it around, do the same thing until it's nice and smooth. All right, this is slightly off subject, but still related. I love, love, love this process. So what I have here is some shop made plywood. And what I mean by that is I take two layers of quarter inch for this thickness, two layers of quarter inch and put a piece of veneer, raw veneer in between those two layers. And you can see how I'm turning this veneer 90 degrees with the grain to the two pieces of plywood. So that keeps it uh, balanced, right? And I'm using epoxy to adhere this veneer in between these two layers of quarter inch. And what you end up with is a very flat, straight, strong material. This panel that I'm making is going to end up being a, it'll look like a panel, but it'll actually be a secret door. So I need it to be dead flat. And of course this has glue from adhering the cherry all the way around but I know by siding these edges that it is very straight and flat. So that is really awesome. So anyway, this cherry banding has been applied all the way around and I'm gonna get that flush with this substrate, shop made plywood. Get this dude in here. Get this guy up a little. So I'm gonna go through this process just to show you how versatile a belt sander is. Now I can run this through my drum sander, that'd be one way to get this flush. But uh, let's say you didn't have a drum sander, but you had a belt sander, this is a fantastic choice for doing this process. So keep in mind when you're sanding a couple of things. Uh, first of all, this cherry or this wood, solid wood is going to be harder than the substrate. So it's kind of backwards from what I'm wanting because this cherry is slightly sticking up. I need to get this flush. So in order to accommodate that, we'll just let the pressure of the belt sander be in the appropriate position. In other words, when I'm sanding this edge, I want this, the center of this pad or somewhere in here in the, what I would call the balance point of this sander, that is going to be applying the pressure right on that solid cherry. So I would be right, right at that tipping point and just pulled back slightly. That way I'm not gonna be putting any pressure back here where this back roller could dig in. And if I'm up here, of course the back of the belt is also gonna dig in. So I need to be right up there like that. To this day and after decades of using a belt sander, I am amazed as to how effective and accurate they can actually be.
And super important to keep that belt sander moving, never let it sit still. And look at that front left corner. You can see a little bit of that unevenness of that miter. And I can just go over that. And I'm focusing pressure right in the middle of the belt sander as I sand that. And it comes right out. I don't know if you can see, but I've got a, a letter A here, which corresponded to this particular piece, and that's still there. So that means there's a little, tiny little bit of a high spot on that cherry. Right here, it's flush. Right in here, it's flush. That feels pretty close, but it's amazing the dexterity of your fingertips and that slight difference that you can feel. Uh, of course, you can always mark this like we've You've probably seen before. Just mark that and that'll help you keep track. That's how you do it, man. Incidentally, the fastest way to sand wood is at a 45 degree angle to the grain. So here I'm sanding that and that just gets flush really quickly because of that 45 degree angle. Something to keep in mind. A question I get asked a lot is how accurate or how accurate will this panel be once I've sanded it? And I'll show you something at the end. Oh yeah, and of course the incomparable low raking light to check for any areas that I may have missed. And this is the sound that you're after. Right? That is flat. So this door will end up getting some sauce hinges and I needed it to be about half inch. The actual thickness wasn't critical, but it does need to be consistent, right? And you can see as I measure around the sides that I'm within a few thousandths of an inch. That is sanded with a belt sander on both sides. So I've heard people say belt sanders are only for rough work. Mm, nah, not exactly. That turned out beautiful, and now I can add face veneers to both sides. So this situation is similar, but different, because this wood is flush with the finished veneer, rather than the veneer going over the solid wood. But it's the same process. I'll get most of that glue off with a scraper, just so it doesn't gum up my belt sander belt. <laughs> So here, the flushness of the solid wood and the veneer were really close. So I just started with a 180 grit belt, right? Just sanding till most of the pencil lines are gone. There will still be a few left. That way I know exactly that I haven't sanded too much. So now I can do the final sanding with an orbital DA and get all the pencil marks off and eliminate any scratches from the 180 grit belt, which are gonna be minimal. And that is it. I absolutely appreciate you watching this. I hope you got something out of this video. Thanks a ton for watching.